the concept of hyping somebody on TikTok did not exist until the locals came on this app. We were a peaceful community last year, all just vibing in the furry and gamer war. And all of a sudden, these little social media colonizers came with their Ayo, Average Day Peretti Check audios, and look what you've done. Look what you did. We used to live in a society. Look what you've done. This is your fault. Snowbirds, get out of here. The internet is a dark, confusing, and weird place, even at the best of times. A technology designed to connect as many people as possible as quickly as possible is at its ups and downs, to say the absolute least. You may have favorite websites, not the websites you visit on a daily basis to post a tweet or to talk with your family, or nerd out about the latest episode of Watchmen and chances to get some internet points, but sites you routinely visit that are uniquely about what you're into and what you like to do. Now what if I told you there is a time in every single website's life cycle where everything is perfect and everyone is truly happy with how things are running. Seems impossible, doesn't it? Well, it all ends. It all ends really quickly. And as quickly as you love that website, it can fall apart quite easily. In fact, there's a term about what happens when that perfection has a time limit on it, and you're about to learn about it. It's a time when everything may seem as normal as a day in spring, but it is unending. Welcome, Welcome to the Eternal September. Do you remember? No, but no, but seriously, do you remember a time in your life where everything seemed perfect and amazing? Like everything around you was in its right place. You had a sense of calm, an idea of who you were and what you could do and what you could be. And that's what the eternal September is like before it happens. It's a time in the life of a website right before there's a rush of whole new people, but right after the site establishes a level of culture that seeps through the entire community. Now let's go all the way back a very, very long time ago to where the first interpretation of the Eternal September began. It, again, it's just one interpretation, but the Eternal September has its origins in Usenet. Usenet is like if Twitter and Reddit had a baby, but was somehow much more nerdier and a little less racist. Just a tiny bit, just a little, little bit less. The Eternal September is specifically the same September that Judgment Night brought hip hop and rock together in the most beautiful way possible, Days and Confused became the sleeper hit of the year, and the same September Rolling Stone released this very provocative cover. I mean, interviewing Woody Allen only a year after he said he loves Sun Yi? Gee, the time is September 1993. And while all this stuff is happening offline, online, America is about to get down on it. Because that was like a song. And anyway, September was always a hectic time for Usenet, but it was about to get a whole lot worse for those users in one way. The ISP America Online began offering Usenet access to many of its users, something that Usenet, its community, and its users were 100% not entirely prepared for. Before that September, Usenet was much like Facebook and was simply available to anybody with a university email or had access to a college server. Of course, every September, at the exact same time, every single year, you'd see a whole bunch of new freshmen signing up for Usenet. Like every September, it was happening, but then it didn't stop. People would be logging on and sharing discussions about the series finale of Saved by the Bell or the ongoing problems in Waco, Texas, or this weird new guy named Conan on NBC who used to be a writer for The Simpsons. I mean, how did he even get a show? The problem is that with AOL, this is something the Usenet team was kind of aware of, but not prepared for. What they weren't aware of, or who they weren't aware of, was specifically Jan Brandt, AOL's chief marketing officer. Jan had a quota, and that quota was to beat the hell out of AOL's competition the best way possible you could in 1993 by sending out as many fucking discs as you possibly could to give people free internet. Take that, CompuServe and Prodigy. No, not the Prodigy. Look, Prodigy used to be a whole other, like, ISP. Anyway, by the end of September 1993, AOL had spent more than 20,000 US dollars to send out more than half a million discs to people all over the United States. And as they say, the rest is history. However, that September on Usenet, no one really knew what they had or what was actually happening until several months later. The term Eternal September was actually not uttered during that entire month or even that entire year. It would take until January 1994 and a man named David Fisher said it best. It's moot now. September 1993 will go down in net history as a September that never ended. Everyone at the time on Usenet felt like maybe there were just a few extra freshmen enrolling a little bit late. However, by the time October rolled around, the problem was a little bit more obvious. The problem was that the users really didn't know what they were doing. There was a level of etiquette they weren't really getting, and there were very few places to actually go on the internet, especially when you were given access directly to something this unique. This had people trying to understand how Usenet worked, how the community ultimately functioned, and what was later coined as netiquette. It 
first showed how natives handled new digital tribesmen and how they were finding their way online. And while some stuck around, learned the rules, many Usenet users were simply not happy and were annoyed at the influx of these new users. To many, it felt as if September 1993 truly never ended. Some old users parted ways with the website and made their own or simply broke off and joined other communities. It was something very unique to the internet. The once thriving mozzarella.org called itself Eternal September and would regularly update the number of days since September 1993 on its website in a loving and fitting tribute. While other communities around the world offline had experienced something very, very similar, this was the first time it happened online and to such a large group of people that while there wasn't exactly a revolt, it was definitely acknowledged. For possibly the first time in internet history, it was actually quantified and characterized as an issue. Whether or not it was positive or negative is definitely up to debate. And since 1993, many different websites and communities have gone through a similar type of Eternal September. In a way, the concept can easily be broken down into being part of the three stages of a website's life cycle, and how Eternal September can be a positive or a negative depending on how the community reacts. Firstly, there's launch, where the website starts to pick up steam and people start coming and going as they please. From there, you see the first major spike when there is a community that forms naturally around the platform. Usually a meme or a news story occurs around the website, positive or negative again, which causes people to usually flock to it, almost like a stake or a flag in the ground saying that this is ours and this is what we mean. Some people stay and some of those people affect the overall community, coin phrases, make changes, make memes even, maybe even get hired by the company itself. And from there, you will eventually have the eternal September, a time where the website hits its biggest possible peak. It's when a website is in full swing and everyone embraces the way that the website is meant to be used for better or worse. It is a functional platform that delivers a certain service and is ultimately taken advantage of by the new users. If it was in, say, music terms, it'd be the Beach Boys pet sounds. For the Beatles, it'd be Abbey Road or Let It Be. For movies, it'd be Spielberg's run from the 80s or the Scorsese filmography from 1973 to 1985. For video games, it would be Valve games from 1998 until 2007. For television, it would be HBO 1999 to 2016, or NBC's 2006 to 2014 Thursday Night lineup, or Adult Swim from 2001 to 2010. However, this is all very subjective, even the list that I just made now. Like I said before, the Eternal September can actually be quantified and studied by checking the Monthly Active Users, or MAU, on most websites. To put it simply, the peak of the internet culture often happens right before a huge influx of new users whether they want it to or not. However, the overall problem with the concept of Eternal September is a conceit that the story is based on the voice of a few hundred thousand users or people who are claiming that they were there first. It's a story predominantly written by white straight males who are internet users who are basically trying to consider that they were the originators of the website or the culture even if they are just the community there and not the original founders. It's also similar to like a clubhouse dynamic where it's like the he-man woman haters club kind of thing. The point I'm basically making here is that the Eternal September is problematic to say the least. The internet should be for everyone, and yes, not every website is for everyone, for better or worse. It does have a level of confusion when it comes to who was there first, who were making claims first, and who actually helped create the culture for the website. It's very abstract and white and weird, and, and people change, and so do websites. Sometimes the Eternal September can be less about the amount of people coming and going from a website, but more about what may change within the culture to cause division. The time when the website becomes a parody of itself, or, or maybe even becomes better, or simply becomes so terrible you wonder why you stuck around in the first place. For a much more modern example of Eternal September, we can look at different websites that have had different cultures built around them. For example, with 4chan, you could look at the invention of Poll, or when Moot sold 4chan to 2chan. For Facebook, this would be simply when Facebook opened it up its user base for everybody who didn't have a university email. For Vine, it would basically be the end of Vine or around about January 2015 when branded Vines became a huge thing amongst the user base. For Tumblr, it would be when they removed all the porn or the 4chan raids or the Yahoo acquisition, depending on what made you want to click off the website in the first place. For YouTube, it would be the adpocalypse or the introduction of YouTube Red. For Instagram, it's actually only a few months ago when they removed likes. For Twitter, it would be the 2016 election, or according to this article, uh, June 2013. For Reddit, there are a lot of examples here, such as the search for the Boston Bombers, the Ellen Powell drama, or the Fappening, uh, which actually, based on the MAU and this wonderful look at the Google Trends, might have actually been the most obvious case. But what happens when you're in the middle of an eternal September? 
What does that look like? What does that feel like? I, I can tell you now, as somebody who's been online for nearly 20 years at this point, is that it feels kind of nice. It feels good being one of those new users and being able to talk with all those people online and how you found the website and what it actually could be awesome that you could bring to it. It's kind of fun. But I can say right now that the most modern example would be TikTok. I think right now, and I could be extremely wrong about this and literally a few days after this video goes up, I think the Eternal September is either coming for TikTok or it's happening right now. Some say that it may have actually happened earlier this year when all the people joined after all the cringe compilations and people started to get famous from TikTok. But I say that the best is yet to come for TikTok, to be honest. Not because I've just recently joined and hey, you can follow me right here, but please don't. But again, this is all me being a dick and just being very, very subjective about why internet websites come and go and rise and fall. I would say that time will truly tell when these websites and platforms hit their peak eternal September. I mean, yes, you can look at the MAUs and when websites crash shortly afterwards. I mean, if, for example, if we wanted to look at the biggest rise and fall of video I hope to cover in the future, Dig would be a fantastic example of that. But that being said, eternal September has a lot of problematic issues around it and in itself is possibly very, very subjective. If you think X used to be good until Y came along, kind of sounds fucked up and maybe you have other biases that you're not being honest about, but yes, a website can have its issues, both financially, socially, and personally, when a huge influx of users come and a whole bunch of classic users go. It's a rolling tide. It comes in and it comes out. What it washes out are sometimes the best content creators of our time, but they never really disappear because they usually end up on another website. They're always there. Their posts live on in archives, in the Wayback Machine, on servers, and most importantly, in our memories. The Eternal September is a perfect distillation of nostalgia, to be honest. A feeling that we've all felt sometimes on the internet when we see a lot of new people coming to a website. It's daunting and scary, and honestly, it's difficult when you're a content creator. I felt very, very anxious when I started to take YouTube seriously about two years ago. Then now it's going okay. It's not great, it's not amazing, I'm just glad that people watch my videos, but I feel like I'm a part of a new Eternal September on YouTube, one that outlived the apocalypse, one that's been trying to deal with all these algorithm changes, and hopefully one that will survive whatever COWPA or copper deals to all the new content creators. I'm gonna be around. I love having an audience that listens to what I have to say and about the topics that I like to talk about, and I know that I had a really dark time this year, and a lot of communities, especially YouTube, helped me through that a lot. So as a final thank you, and thanks for watching my videos this year, it's been a hard slog, but I really wanted to thank everyone so much, and I wanted to leave with this clip that I think perfectly summarizes the Eternal September. It's from a show that I like, but not necessarily love, The Office and I'll let uh, Ed Helms take the rest of it from here. I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. Do you remember the 21st night? I kind of said thank you and all that stuff before the end of the video, but again, I really wanted to say thank you so much. I will be launching a Patreon in 2020, but until then you can support me at co-fi.com slash harrisonvid. Whatever you can contribute helps. It helps me so much. And I really just want to thank everybody who has liked and subscribed and commented and shared and done so much for my videos over the last year. Uh, I know, you know, 5,000 subscribers isn't a lot in the grand scheme of things, but I love every single one of you uh, so, so much. The fact that you all enjoy, well, I'm sure not all of you, but some of you enjoy my videos uh, it means a lot. And with a topic this dry, it's um, it's difficult difficult to uh, imagine a lot of people liking it. Anyway, I'm talking too long and this video is already too long as it is. But thank you all so much for watching this and enjoying this. Please do share it out. Please do like and subscribe if you watch this all the way through. Uh, and until then, uh, I'll see you guys next year. Bye.